it's difficult to become a good software designer. Usually we just uh, wait around and practice and hope that we become better over time. There's an old saying, uh, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. And as a software developer who's trying to grow, it can be very frustrating to hear from other people uh, that we should just make our design simple. Because if I knew how to do that, I would already be a good software designer, right? So uh, what I'm going to talk about here today is that by using contracts, it's not a full answer for how to be a good software developer, be a good designer, but it is putting us on the right path. And it makes certain things that are only really visible to experts once they become good software developers. Uh, it makes those kinds of things more visible to everyone and allows you to get better faster. In particular, we're going to see how contracts reveal the messiness in your design, if it's there, how they can help the separation of concerns, and help how they can help communicate the design uh, from out of your head into your uh, colleagues' heads and, and vice versa. So let's take an example to start with. And I'm going to say right off the bat that I've made this example uh, as crazy as possible and you wouldn't do this literally. But let's imagine that a customer calls up and reports a bug and their invoice was calculated wrong. It's off by $5. And here's where the crazy part starts. Let's imagine your coworker suggests, let's go change the ad routine. Okay, so nobody would really change the ad routine and would never suggest that. But the point is, there's a lot of times when there is a wrong place to add uh, some bit of logic. And this is one that we can all agree on is probably not the right place for us to fix. But your coworker says, look, for this exact invoice, there's an addition happening of 10 and 15, and it really needs to return $5 less. So we can just put the if statement in there. Now, what I want you to imagine is putting being in the situation where you're arguing against this person. There's no question that this patch to the code is gonna work, right? Now, it might at some point cause a different problem, right? Because now the addition code is more complicated and it's got this funny little special case in it that's gonna give uh, weird answers. And so probably you're expecting a bug to pop up somewhere else. But at this moment, your colleague has a proposed patch. It's probably like a one line fix and you need to argue against it, okay? And this is the situation I want you to consider yourself in. So. Here's what would happen if we had contracts, right? If we were thinking about this starting with contracts. So here's a plausible contract for the ad routine. It returns X plus Y within some degree of precision, okay? And if we took your colleague's suggestion, you might have something like this. When X plus Y is you're adding 10 and 15, it returned 20, which clearly is a crazy thing to do, but it's in the contract now. Otherwise, it returns X plus Y. Now. The thing about this is, as soon as we write that contract down, your design sense starts tingling, just like it did previously when you just had a subjective feel for it. But what you can do is you can point to that contract, right? And you can say, that contract looks wrong to me. And you and your coworker can have a discussion about it. And so you can say, there's no question that contract is now more complicated than it was before, right? And you can even argue about whether that contract is surprising, whether it's going to cause bugs and so forth, okay? Uh, so again, I would like you to take this example, uh, not exactly about editing ad routines, uh, but instead of generalizing and imagine there's some code somewhere, someone's suggesting sticking an if statement in it, and you're trying to say, look, but it's going to complicate the contract and cause trouble. So boy, the way I think about this is that contracts are like an invisible hand uh, that is guiding your design. and they don't tell you what to do. I mean, clearly the contracts are just a statement of what your design is, but by writing down the contracts and making them visible, they can open your eyes and make visible something that you did that like might be a small amount of code, but it's actually conceptually a, a very big deal, a conceptually a big problem. So what the contracts do is they draw your attention and allow you to seek the simplicity yourself. Okay, so in that previous example, we were not seeking simplicity, we actually created complexity. And here's the thing, in the end, you are the force of simplicity. Even though I phrase it as 
contracts or the invisible hand that guides design. What they're really doing is they're allowing your uh, natural desires for simplicity and for elegance uh, and for good design to come out. And it, it gives them, uh, gives that uh, something that you can tangibly look at in terms of like, well, if I'm overall in the system making my contracts simpler, I'm probably on the right path for uh, making a good design. So I've thought about this, and I think there's several different ways that the contracts influence us and, and cause us to want to change our designs. So for example, uh, we hate typing long contracts and we sh seek short ones, right? We don't want our contracts to feel like a convoluted legal uh, document that we all hate. Instead, we want them short and sweet, okay? So just the act of trying to find that short, sweet contract is gonna cause us to do a couple things. First, that we would operate uniformly because every time we have to add an if statement, we're gonna see that in the contract. And then second, we're gonna minimize the number of edge cases we have. So uh, if we can find a way to say, for any kinds of values you pass in, we consistently do the same thing, it's a whole lot easier than saying, well, unless there's zero, or unless there's 10, or unless in this case there's uh, 10 and 15. So another way is that, uh, that contracts influence us to, towards good designs is that they encourage us to decompose one complicated method into two simpler ones, okay? And it, also, if you think about this from the testing angle, it's the same kind of force. It can be much easier to say what this one simple thing does, for example, add, uh, than it is to jam together add plus the bug fix, okay? So you end up uh, separating out a few things and having greater confidence that the small things uh, work in isolation uh, very simply. Another way that contracts influence us is that they encourage us to operate on an entire domain. Now, you may, if you've been studying functional programming, know that what I'm hinting at here is a total function, okay? So, for example, um, imagine you had a, a method like uh, is pretty and it was operating on a string which was uh, representing a color. So you can say is pretty red um, and you'd say, well, but for some strings that's not well defined. So if I said is pretty hovercraft, man, well, I don't know what, I don't know how to answer that question because it's not a color. So uh, instead, if we had an enumeration of colors, for example, red, green, and blue, I could operate on all of those consistently and be, be confident that, uh, you know, for anything you pass in, in that enumeration, I, I know how to act on it. Uh, one more way that contracts influence us is they encourage us to minimize side effects. Again, going back to uh, some of the ideas from functional programming, this is talking about pure functions. It's easier to reason about things that don't have side effects, okay? If they only depend on the inputs and the only result that you see is coming from the outputs. And then finally, related to the hating long contracts, if we find the same sort of thing being stated over and over again, uh, for example, in the post condition, and my link list does not have a loop at the end, I can factor that out and just say, really, that's just me factoring out a common statement. No matter what happens, my link list will never have a loop. So the result of all this, all these like the, the golden, or the, the invisible hand that's, that's nudging us in the right direction, is that you're going to have complications in your program, but it tries to guide those. It has the effect of guiding those into more appropriate places. So going back to that customer invoice example, the customer invoice was wrong. Look, you have to fix it. But there are better or worse places that you can tuck away uh, that logic or that uh, the code to fix it. So when we're programming with contracts and we're trying to keep our contracts simple, it, we love this idea that we compose simpler parts into more complicated ones. So we're gonna to have to find somewhere uh, to fix that customer invoice, but it probably is not gonna be the ad routine because it had this terrible effect on the contract I've got. So what I've noticed is when you start thinking in contracts, you start trying to find ways I can say, well, this is a big problem to solve, but this smaller part of this big problem I can like write a simple contract and solve that completely. And then I can chip away until eventually you've got a lot of things which are so simple and, and really obviously work that you can compose them in and solve the bigger problem. And finally, even if you can't find a really good place to put the complication that you're dealing with, even when it goes into the wrong place, the contract is at least telling you and warning other people about what's going on here. And I wanna contrast that with 
you've got a module out there, it's got some if statements in there that you didn't ever, you haven't read about. And those things are just gonna cause you a surprise at some point. At least by putting in the contract, you know, you're, you're highlighting the fact that there's something surprising that's gonna go on here. So what happens to teams when they use contracts? The first thing I've noticed is that they end up using logic as a tool for simplifying their thinking, not just procedural thinking. They use procedural reasoning and procedural thinking, of course, but what they use that for is reasoning to make sure that the contract is being satisfied. So they'll read through the steps of an implementation and go, yep, I think I'm pretty sure that what uh, the contract that we're talking about, this code will actually uh, satisfy that. And then finally, uh, two particular kinds of things are top of mind for these teams. The first is predicates and the second is invariants. Okay, that uh, when a team is using contracts, they talk in terms of what must always be true or what must never be true in certain modules or certain methods. And they start building up a vocabulary of predicates. Uh, so for example, is a premium customer, right? And they build those up and they talk about them a lot because that's the language that they're using, the language of logic uh, that they see in the contracts. So I'm just gonna give an example. Now this is a pretty standard design for the way that you can build a server. And you can build it with three modules. The first one is dealing with the HTTP handling or whatever protocol you're using for talking to the outside world. The second module is the business logic. And that is the logic of what you do. So for example, maybe you're calculating invoices like we talked about the early example. And then the third module is persistence, which is, uh, okay, I've got this invoice, uh, I need to put it down on disk for permanent storage, or uh, I know I have a customer who's just come in here, I need to pull their invoice off the disk, okay? So pretty standard design to have those three different modules. But what I want you to think about is the, the contracts, uh, the precondition, or the uh, predicates, and the invariants that we would have here. So if I had one module that was only doing the packing and unpacking from say HTTP and JSON and uh, moving that into uh, the business logic of dealing with invoices, that module would be allowed to depend upon the interchange libraries, let's say a JSON library. It would be allowed to depend on the HTTP libraries for parsing the HTTP message that comes in. And it would depend upon our logic for the business logic, our, our module for the business logic. But what it would not depend upon is the persistence or the libraries for the database, okay? That's categorically off the table, so there is an invariant there. Similarly with the business logic, uh, it would not depend on HTTP or JSON or exchange data types. It would also not depend on the database or remote procedure calls or any of that kind of stuff. It would be allowed to depend upon our persistence module. So in this business logic, it has like everything about invoices. It knows how to deal with invoices, but what you've done is you've uh, factored out and made the problem simpler by removing all those, uh, those other problems. And then finally, in the persistence module, again, it would have no dependency on the HTTP, uh, JSON, the, the data types that are there, or the business logic, but it would know about the database or maybe RPCs that you use, uh, remote procedure calls uh, for, for, for chatting with other stuff. And of course, it would depend on the data types as they exist on disk. So again, the point of all this is that uh, using contracts or thinking in contracts and thinking about predicates and invariants uh, has this invisible force on your design. And what you'll see is when teams are thinking about contracts, top of mind, that they start having designs that look like this. So instead of like one big server, right, module that does all of these things, it's been factored out into three things, okay, three different modules, each of which has clearer contracts that are easier to test and easier to understand. So here's a concrete suggestion. When you're writing your code, and let's say you're using a version control repository like uh, GitHub or something, go ahead and drop a readme.md or design.md or uh, architecture.md uh, file right next to your code and write out the, the, uh, the rules of the road here. This is a description of your design and it uh, is great at communicating uh, the, the design that you've got with the rest of the coworkers. So in summary, it's difficult to become a good software designer. Uh, I, if I could wave a magic wand and say, you know, bing, uh, here, let me uh, help you get there immediately, I would do that. Uh, what I am talking about here with contracts, I'm saying because I believe it will help accelerate you towards becoming a better software designer. I believe that thinking about contracts uh, is a mindset 
that helps us make our design simple. The contracts reveal the messy parts. They help us separate out two different concerns to the extent that we can. And they help uh, a team talk about the design and communicate it so everyone understands how the design is supposed to work. Now, the contracts aren't foolproof, but they can help you uh, guide, it can guide you towards simpler designs and help your uh, desire to make things simple. Uh, they, they let you operate on that and achieve that better.